<coughs> excuse me, uh, the day and the, and the guard have been partnering, partnering for years on uh, debates such as this. We both feel strongly about providing that public service, and I'd like to publicly thank the Seagulls for opening up the guard uh, free of charge to all of us, um, which they do uh, quite often, great community service. Um, tonight's debate is being live streamed on the day.com and WFSB's website. It's not on TV, but being live streamed. Um, the, debate, the debate will then be available on both those websites, you know, if you want to watch it again or if you want to watch it closer to the election. Um, <clears throat> that's all I have. Is, oh, I would implore all of you to, to, to let the candidates um, finish their answers uh, before you react. Um, that's what we're here for, is, is to hear their answers to the questions that our panel who I'll introduce in a little bit, are going to ask. We want to know how these three gentlemen stand on the issues, so please let them answer the questions and finish them. Any interruptions is just, is just going to take away from uh, their opportunity uh, to, to answer the questions. So thank you for that in advance. So we're going to go live in uh, a couple minutes. We're, we're live. Welcome and good evening from the Guard Arts Center in New London. I'm Tim Cotter, the executive editor of the day. We're here for the second district congressional debate, which is being sponsored tonight by the day, WFSB News 3, the Guard Arts Center, and the League of Women Voters. I'd like to introduce the candidates uh, at this point, starting to my immediate left, the Republican candidate, State Rep. Mike France. The Democratic incumbent, U.S. Rep. Joe Courtney. and the Green Party endorsed candidate, Kevin Blacker. We have a panel of three outstanding journalists tonight that will be, answer, that will be asking the questions. Sten Spinella, who's the day's government reporter. Susan Raff, who is Channel 3's chief political reporter. And Mark Pazniokas, who is the Capitol Bureau Chief for the Connecticut Mirror. The format tonight. The format tonight will be: each candidate will have a 60-second opening statement. For the questions, the first person will have 60 seconds. The next two candidates will have 90 seconds, and then it will return to the original candidate for a 30-second rebuttal. We'll end the night with a two-minute closing statement. We drew numbers before the debate um, to determine the order. And Representative France, your opening statement is first, and you have 60 seconds. Oh, and I would like to remind the candidates, there's, there's lights that are going to show up that you'll be able to see. Um, there they are. Green, yellow, red, to help you on the timing. Obviously, yellow is you're running out of time, wind down. Red is you're done. Please stop. So let's try, I know it's difficult, let's try to stay within the 60 seconds or 90 seconds. So you're all going to have plenty of opportunity to talk. So let's try to stick to that as much as we can. So Representative France. Thank you. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, the Day, and WFSB, and the Guard Art Theater for sponsoring this event. I come from a lifetime of service. Following in the footsteps of my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father, and two uncles, who all served careers in the military. I enlisted in the Navy, volunteered for submarine duty, and earned my Silver Dolphins, and finished my 20-year career right here in Groton as supervisor of shipbuilding, responsible for the oversight and the delivery of the combat system on the Virginia-class submarine. I entered public service, serving my town for three years as a town councilor, and currently serves as state representative. I'm running for Congress because I believe the people of Eastern Connecticut deserve a leader 
who will put them first, not somebody who puts the party and their party ahead of the people. Thank you. Representative Courtney. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Tim. Chris Dodd once famously said, the greatest social program is a good job. Those words have been the North Star during my time in Congress and my service on the Sea Power Subcommittee in the U.S. House and now as chair of that subcommittee, uh, I've worked hard and have been part of the solution in terms of bringing back thousands of jobs into this region at Electric Boat Shipyard and submarine suppliers across the region and the state of Connecticut. Um, again, that has not been the limit of, our, of my work. We have brought millions of dollars into this region uh, from the Department of Labor so that people can connect to these opportunities. And the Eastern Connecticut Manufacturing Pipeline just graduated their 2,700th person whose lives have been transformed because of that opportunity. Chris Dodd was right. A good job means you can support yourself, your family, and your community. And tonight we're going to discuss a lot of issues like health care and education, uh, public safety, cost of living. But just remember that when you have a good job, the economic security and confidence that comes with that means that we can solve those problems. Thank you. Mr. Blacker. So my name is Kevin Blacker. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. I grew up in the Noank section of Groton, attended public schools, uh, got a degree in soil science from the University of New Hampshire. I bring common sense uh, and recent practical experience. Uh, you know, I, I, if I was to, to win this election, uh, the issues that I'm uh, most interested in focusing on are uh, honest, common sense government practical, affordable solutions to climate change, and uh, supporting viable, uh, independent local newspapers, plus challenging the two-party system. The Green Party was aware of uh, you know, my work uh, at State Pier to bring attention to uh, the dishonesty and bad judgment over there, and they offered me their hard-earned ballot line, and uh, I'm appreciative of that. Thank you. Sten Spinella will be asking the first question. We'll, we'll go in the same order of the candidates, and after that, the order will change, so each candidate will, will get a chance to go first. Sten? Okay, thanks. Hi, gentlemen. Um, income inequality in the U.S. continues to get worse every year. The poorest half of America, 150 million people, hold only 2% of the country's total wealth while the top 10% holds 72% of the country's wealth. Do you consider this an important issue, and if elected, how would you work to address it? I think the issue at hand is important because we need to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to succeed in our country as a hallmark of the founding of our country. The fact that we have disparity in income is a significant issue and the challenge that we face, frankly, is that government has gotten in the way. When you look at the price of goods, you look at the cost of living, you look at the ability to earn a living to raise a family, the regulation, the taxation of government is the biggest impediment to that. We need to return to a situation where the people are free to live their lives and make choices that makes sense for their families. This is something that we don't have when the government is mandating and telling us what we can and can't do, limiting our abilities to make a job, to start a business because of licensing requirements and other restrictions. Those are things I think we need to look at to ensure that the people are free to make choices in their lives. Thank you. So <clears throat> I think uh, actually one of the driving forces for the polarization in this country is precisely uh, what you mentioned, Sten, which is that the, as income inequality has widened, uh, again, I think this country whose social contract, I think, kept uh, a vibrant and healthy middle class has also been strained really almost to the breaking point. Uh, an example of where I think um, that inequality was worsened was in the 2017 Trump tax cut, where 80% of the tax benefit went to the top 1%. And corporations, again, got a huge uh, benefit in terms of reducing their corporate uh, tax rate. Um, just a few months ago, we passed the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which at least began the process of rebalancing that inequality. We established a minimum corporate tax of 15% on large corporations who have been reporting profits over a billion dollars. 200 of them pay almost zero in terms of taxes. 
Uh, we also put into place an excise tax in terms of stock buybacks, which is a complete gimmick to avoid uh, paying a fair tax uh, as opposed to getting dividends versus stock buybacks. Um, we also, uh, in 2021, as part of the American Rescue Plan, passed the Refundable Child Tax Credit, which that one measure uh, removed half of uh, America's children in poverty uh, out of poverty. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, even though the House extended that, that um, the blockade in the Senate, uh, led by Mitch McConnell, uh, uh, kept that from being extended. Uh, because that's the kind of tax policy that we really need. And we need to invest in, in programs like education, which is the great equalizer in terms of trying to give people an opportunity, a fair opportunity to succeed in life. Mr. Blocker. So as I understand it, uh, the people with the most money and power, uh, you know, have the most power in, in the government. And uh, they write the rules to benefit themselves. I think that the purpose of the government is supposed to be to serve the people and, and serve the best interest of the people and to uh, you know, do public good. But I think that uh, largely on many levels, uh, the, the, the rules are being written to benefit uh, the, the people that are politically connected. Uh, and I, I think that there's too much money in politics that uh, you, you, know, you have candidates taking uh, you know, money and then serving those, uh, you, you know, people that give them money uh, over the public good. Uh, I think it's a problem in the second district right here. Uh, so I, I do think that, uh, you know, the concentration of wealth, um, it, it's unfair and it's a problem and I think it's, it's largely driven by uh, dishonest government. Representative France, do you want to uh, follow up? Thank you. You know, it's interesting, Joe, you bring up the Inflation Reduction Act when the CBO says it will do nothing to reduce inflation. It's interesting that you bring that up because also the tax cut that you complain about in the Trump administration in 2017 led to the largest increase in average income, the highest employment in our country in, in record. That's the result of reducing impediments to businesses I talked about at the beginning. The 15% minimum tax cut. Our president went across to Europe to countries that have larger tax rates than we do and gave away our sovereignty to them to a minimum tax rate that will impede our ability to be economically successful. Thank you. Thank you. Second question will be asked by uh, Susan and Representative Courtney will go first. Thank you. I wanted to ask you what your plans are to create clean, sustainable energy and just as importantly, affordable. As you know, Connecticut has an aging nuclear power plant. Um, we have uh, plans now, as many of the people in the audience know and you know, for wind power generation here in New London. Uh, that's a fraction uh, of what's needed, right? Nuclear produces most of the power. What are your plans as we see electricity in Connecticut skyrocket and to create more energy and make it more affordable? Sure. So again, going back to the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, there's about $300 billion in new green energy investment, um, which was roundly and en enthusiastically endorsed by Sierra Club, League of Conservation Voters, groups who have been really sounding the alarm about climate change and the need to, to move towards renewable energy. Included in it is uh, an increase in the in uh, uh, investment uh, tax credits for uh, green energy and production tax credits. And this project, which you just referred to here in New London, which is the assembly of offshore wind turbines, um, is going to be a big part of really solving that problem in terms of reducing carbon emissions. The nuclear power plant in Dominion is doing great work for the state. Forty percent at least of the electricity is, uh, for our state is being generated. Um, and uh, I had Secretary uh, Janet Granholm up in the district to visit uh, uh, Dominion the, uh, about a month or two ago where we talked about the fact that the in infrastructure bill was going to allow for service life extension. We need to, we need to extend the, the service life of a critical part of, cl of clean energy if we're going to reduce carbon emissions. Thank you. Mr. Blocker. So in order to greet climate change, we're, we're obviously going to need a clean renewable source of energy. 
it has to be affordable. Our, our electric rates are already way too high. I'll tell the anecdote of my brother who's sitting in the crowd, runs two businesses with his life partner, uh, two, two restaurants, $1,700 for one electric bill, 900 for the other. He's not mining for Bitcoin. He's not growing pot. He, he, he's making pizza and omelets. And, and those electric rates are cripplingly high. We cannot afford... Uh, to have the dishonesty down at uh, you know State Pier in, in rolling out offshore wind, and and have costs go from ninety three million dollars to two hundred fifty five point five million dollars. We, we need radical innovation, uh, you know, radical thought. Things like uh, you know, making and harvesting lightning, or forcing uh, the nuclear generators to clean up their own mess and find a way to generate energy from the waste products. Um, we also need to uh, encourage efficiency, efficiency, just just simply, uh, y you know, use less. But uh, I'll, just, I'll just quickly close by saying that this radical innovation, people are going to think that the people doing it are crazy, and some will laugh and say, no, they're not crazy, they're just intense. But it's going to take outside of the box radical thought. Thank you. Representative France. Uh, thank you. This is issue, uh, green energy, is a result of literally decades of government deciding that the only source of true green energy is wind and solar. Growing up in California, I've seen f over 50 years of these policies. And the challenge we see out there is a lesson in making sure that we have a robust portfolio of sources of energy, not just limited to what the government decides is green. We've seen recently in California where the governor has mandated that they cannot use their appliances between four, don't charge your electric vehicle between four and nine o'clock at night because they don't have the capacity. What's also interesting is that in the last couple of months uh, with the uh, Germany going back to using dirty coal, that the EU has declared both natural gas and nuclear as sources of green energy. We now know that the decision on green energy to be only wind and solar was purely political, and that the other sources of nuclear, which is the cleanest energy we have, and natural gas, which provides energy at a lower uh, exhaust rate. But the issue is, frankly, that the government is deciding this by how they fund research. When you only fund research out of the government to green energy that they decide is green, solar and wind, you've missed the opportunity to continue to expand the catalytic converter and other sources to reduce the exhaust of our existing vehicles and provide the ability of people to travel freely and not be dependent on a grid that can't support them. Great. So I think Mike ought to look closer at the Department of Energy's budget because actually there is huge investment in terms of ways to uh, reprocess nuclear waste to, to reduce the volume of it. And there are also, uh, as was reported just this week in the day, uh, again, new funding to uh, set up an interim waste storage program, which uh, again would finally get this waste moving out of communities like Waterford uh, and Haddam Neck, who uh, were never um, told that you know they were going to be there, that waste was going to be there indefinitely. So there is R&D that's going on there. And I would just note that that energy bill that we just passed the estimates in, by credible sources that will reduce carbon emissions by 40 percent by, by the year 2030, which is far in excess of where the, this country was in terms of reducing uh, fossil fuel uh, activity and carbon emissions. Thank you. Uh, next question will be from Mark, and Kevin Blacker will go first. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, Connecticut's one of 37 states that has legalized medical marijuana, but yet um, federal law lumps marijuana uh, together with heroin as a, a drug that has no medical use and is highly addictive. Should, should marijuana be stricken from the list of Schedule One drugs uh, so that Connecticut and the other states that have not only legalized it for medical purposes but for recreational and research purposes uh, can more freely regulate it and uh, monetize it. Yes, absolutely. I, I believe very strongly uh, in the potential, uh, you, you know, uh, medical benefits of uh, 
uh, of marijuana. So yes, I would uh, absolutely support uh, having it removed, you know, from that schedule so that uh, it, it could be used more freely. Okay, Representative France. I think I agree. The the pushing marijuana in this level one, schedule one drug uh, does not be, make sense when cocaine is a schedule two drug. And medical marijuana has had tremendous benefit to uh, reducing pain, uh, and we've seen that evidence over time. I think that the challenge that we face is how do we ensure that the medical side of that is, is maintained whole? How do we make sure that the individuals that uh, have that need and have the prescription for it can obtain that? And I think that would help the process and be able to provide the benefit to the people of, of Connecticut and the other states that have chosen, chosen to provide the medical marijuana process. So again, my answer is also yes, and in fact, I voted um, numerous times in the House to, to do precisely that. Um, the, the fact that uh, marijuana is still on Schedule One at the same time that uh, now almost dozens of states have legalized it in various forms um, is, is an, a contradiction that uh, Congress needs to resolve. Unfortunately, again, running into the blockade uh, in the Senate, uh, we've not been able to finish that job. Uh, one perfect example of the incongruity of this is that um, for businesses that are legally selling uh, marijuana as part of a medical dispensary or even recreational in the states where that's happened, um, they can't bank in federally uh, licensed and chartered banks. And we actually have um, stories across the country in terms of uh, large cash um, having um, piled up in, in these businesses and actually have its, its increased uh, crime in, in some of those areas there. Uh, again, so there's, there's um, sort of incremental changes to, to fix this problem. There's the Safe Banking Act, which would take marijuana off Schedule One for the purposes of banking. And then there's just the uh, overall arching uh, approach, which would be to remove it from Schedule One entirely. Again, we, we have passed these measures in the House now numerous times. Again, I've been a, a, an I vote. On those, on those measures, and, and again, I think we need to eliminate that incongruity. Thank you. Mr. Blocker, anything to add? Uh, I mean, if I'm going to lose my time, then I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll follow up by saying, you know, since we're all in agreement that there isn't, uh, you know, I don't have a rebuttal, but I would ask, uh, you know, the, the press to follow up with Joe uh, and, and print in the paper to educate the public what it is he believes the issue, uh, if, if it's been voted for, what, what the issue, what the holdup is, and, and uh, you, you know, what could be done uh, to overcome that. Okay, um, back to uh, Sten Spinello and um, Representative France will start. Then you have mics. Thank you. Um, there's been some back and forth this campaign about Congressman Courtney's uh, record on securing submarine contracts. So I'm going to ask each of you a question. You can use your time to answer it. For Mr. Courtney, what is your response to people who say your success in securing subcontracts is owed more to a sub base, a sub base being in the district than your negotiating skills? For Mr. France, why do you think you'd be able to replicate Mr. Courtney's record? And for Mr. Blacker, do you support the current rate of procurement or would you rather try and do something different? As I discussed at the beginning, my background uh, serves that. When I served on submarines and I finished my career here as an acquisition professional responsible for the construction of submarines, I understand the submarine industry is something more than just a line item in the budget. When you look at the submarine industry as, as a whole, and you look at what's become literally a political slogan of two sub Joe, you look across in our national security, and on Joe's watch, we've seen China surpass us in maritime superiority in numbers of ships compared to us. On his watch, recent Wall Street Journal editorial said that we are eight submarines behind where we need to be to meet the national security needs. Have you ever heard Joe talk about three submarines per year? I never have. And what's the, what's the issue? The challenge is that we need to have that capacity. Why? Because at the end of the submarine, uh, the Los Angeles class submarine program, 
We were de delivering three to five submarines a year. So we're decommissioning those submarines now, and we need to be able to replace them. Great. So um, first of all, you know, the, the effort to save the sub base in 2005 was a great success for Team Connecticut. And again, I gave my predecessor um, big kudos uh, for that. I was actually up in Boston at the BRAC hearing cheering him and Chris Todd and Joe Lieberman on uh, when, when the uh, Navy and, and the Commission took that uh, decision away and kept the base open. But believe me, that's a totally separate enterprise than, than, the, than submarine <coughs> shipbuilding. In the three years before I was elected to Congress, there were 1,400 layoffs down at EB because we were operating at an anemic one sub per year rate, which is exactly what it was when you were on the Virginia program. Uh, so uh, again, uh, I came in and we went right to work, got an authorization through Armed Services. I brought Jack Murtha, the, the lead appropriator, up to uh, Groton who made a commitment to match the authorization with an appropriation. That's where, where Rob uh, Simmons fell short. Um, and I also worked with Dan Inouye, who was the iconic senator from Hawaii, who was the lead appropriator there, met with him twice. And we got that advanced procurement through. And that's where the two sub Joe uh, nickname came from, from Congressman Taylor in Mississippi. Again, in future years, we have had um, challenges where the Obama administration tried to cut a sub in 2013, we reversed that. I worked with my Republican counterparts, Randy Forbes from Hampton Roads, to, to reverse that cut. And in 2020, Donald Trump came over with a budget that cut a submarine. Mike Esper came over and testified, and I gave him a hard time. He complained about it, actually, in his recent memoir. And we were able to reverse that cut, again, on a bipartisan basis. We do have three subs. We have the Columbia program, which we simultaneously uh, have been working on to authorize and approve. Those things are two and a half times the sub size of Virginia. Okay. And with that work, we have more than three subs Thank a you. year. Mr. Blacka. So do I support the current rate, or would I advocate for something different? Uh, first thing I need to do was find the truth. Do we need two subs a year? And now Joe Courtney and Mike France, likely, likely in their experience, uh, are privy to more information. And obviously, as a congressman, I would have more information. So I would find the truth, the real truth, of whether we needed two subs a year, whether that was best for the public, not just for the second district, but for the, for, you know, for the state and for the country. Uh, now, $3 billion is what one of those subs costs, I believe. So I, I would also ask questions. I mean, I will ask these questions. Uh, you know, how many hungry kids in the second district could we feed with $3 billion? Uh, how many homeless people can we house? How many houses could we outfit with rooftop solar? And, uh, you know, would $3 billion be better spent uh, on education or the arts? So I'm not afraid to ask those questions. Uh, and I would also not, you know, as, as I understand it, and Joe will correct me if I'm wrong, General Dynamics is one of his largest donors. Taking that money and that support, you know, I, I would question, is he doing what's best for general dynamics, or is he d doing what's what's truly best for the public? And uh, you know, I think I'm in a position, not taking any donations, to be able to ask that question. Thank you, Representative France. Back to you. And thank you. And Joe, this is why, as a politician, understanding is a line item in the budget. We don't count the strategic portion of our submarine. We count how many submarines per year we're building when we need fast attack submarines to meet the needs of the Navy. We need three fast attack submarines in order to meet. Los Angeles class decommissioning side. And we continue to fall behind. We need to have three fast attack submarines, and we have not been talking about that. That has been ongoing since the MDAA of 2007, the first year you were in office. We were behind. You got two submarines per year, and you did get the two that were taken out by the presidents, but that is not sufficient to meet the national security needs, and you should know that as a senior member of the House Armed Service Committee. Thank you. Next question will be asked by Susan and Representative Courtney. I believe you're up first. Right? Yep. Thank you. I wanted to talk about jobs. Uh, unfortunately, in this state, we have more job openings than we have workers to fill them. Um, and in this region, we are benefited right by electric boat and uh, first-class submarines uh, creating thousands of jobs. 
Uh, we have casinos nearby, many jobs, not necessarily the best paying, but they are jobs. But in the meantime, cities like New London and Norwich are not necessarily vibrant economic centers uh, for growth. We see a lot of uh, unemployment here is higher in this part of the state uh, than it is uh, all over. I think it's over 7% now. Um, and a lot of businesses are closing in New London and have been closed for a long time. How do you share some of that money or the economic uh, growth that is happening and, and make those cities more vibrant in this area? So for, <clears throat> first of all, I'd, I would encourage you to look at the latest uh, Connecticut uh, Department of Labor statistics that actually showed that uh, the New London Norwich uh, labor market uh, actually grew the fastest uh, in the, over the last year. And uh, part of that is because, uh, again, of the great uh, demand signal that's happening down at the shipyard. Uh, again, there's 533 job openings today as we're standing here. Uh, at, the, at the shipyard, I was over at Collins and Jewel a couple days ago, who uh, is one of the suppliers, he, he, he could hire 10 people like that. But frankly, it's every sector. I mean, you go to L&M Hospital, they are overworked there, they need more staff there. Uh, we need more teachers, uh, you know, they're just uh, really IT, uh, the, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, as someone who's on the Education and Labor Committee, uh, my focus has been about trying to get programs that close the skills gap so that people can actually take advantage of these job openings. Uh, just a, a month or so ago, we had uh, Secretary of Labor Marty Walsh uh, in town where Governor uh, Lamont announced that he was taking $75 million of ARPA funds to boost the job training program that is at MPI, the Manufacturing Pipeline, and expanding it to other sectors. Thank you. Mr. Vlaka. Yeah, so... Connecticut is not a business friendly, it's, it's not a friendly place to do business. It, it is uh, taxes, insurance, regulation, uh, it, it is just a caustic place to, 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 to do business. And uh, you know, if, if we want businesses to grow, I, I majored in soil science, if you want plants to grow, you need to have the conditions in the soil that will allow them to grow. You need to have the pH and the, and, and, you know, <laughs> there that you don't that you don't kill all the all the plants. And there, the, the, the taxes and our utility costs are are, are so high that that businesses, uh, you, you know, can't grow. And if you don't have business, you're not going to have jobs. I think that what you have is the government taking uh, so much, f you know, from the businesses and from from the people and then distributing it to, uh, you know, people that they're connected to. So, um, you know, if you want to revitalize a place like, uh, you know, a city like New London or Willimantic or Norwich, uh, a, p a policy that I would focus on or propose would be, uh, you know, to get, th there, there's a word, it's uh, unlikely partnerships. And I would get agriculture working with the cities uh, as a means of, focusing development in a city to, uh, you know, reduce farmland lost and urban sprawl. So creative, unlikely partnerships. Thank you. Representative France. I think the key to look at is what's changed in the last two years. The policy of the Biden administration, uh, and Nancy Pelosi and the Speaker, and supported by Representative Courtney, have led to inflation, led to recession, led to very big, big challenges in business. And we look at the state of Connecticut, we are one of the least business friendly states in the country. Between regulation and licensing, taxation, it's very difficult to operate a business in this, in this state. You look at the economics, we have an outflow, net outflow of people from this state. Why? Because it is so expensive to live here. Some of that is because when you look at the dollars we send to Washington and what comes back, it's about three quarters of a dollar, 75 cents on the dollar comes back. And when you look at that, that's another taxation on the people trying to live. And so when you try and look to grow the environment for people to work, to fill the, the over 500 jobs that are at EB, you need to have a place where you can afford to raise a family and where you can afford to live. And right now, that's just not the state of Connecticut caused by the policies in Washington compounded by the policies here in the state of Connecticut. We need to do better. 
So again, the question was about the job openings that exist right now in the state and um, the fact that um, we're, we, we need to connect people to those jobs. And that is about, in my opinion, that is the, the strategy that works, is to invest in, in education and skills training so that people will be able to take on that work. Again, when Walsh was here, uh, we were over at Three Rivers Community College about an accelerated uh, nurse entry program, uh, one and a half years, again, with uh, no uh, tuition costs to, to try and, again, stimulate more people, and Yale New Haven Hospital is, is partnering with Three Rivers to, to uh, grow that type of program. Uh, there are models that we know work, and the fact is we need to expand them. Thank you. Mark will ask the uh, next question. And Kevin Blacko will go first. All right. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to see those lights out there. Um, Justice Thomas in the Dobbs case um, suggested that the rationale for overturning Roe v. Wade could apply to cases that have established the right to contraception in this country, uh, the right to sexual practices uh, that uh, are up to consenting adults. Uh, the right to same-sex marriage. So my question to you gentlemen tonight is, should or shouldn't there be a federal right to these very fundamental matters to Americans that the Congress of the United States should or shouldn't take up? Yes, yes, there should be. And that's all I have to say about that. And just say that, uh, you know, I'll just ask in this remaining time whether, uh, y you know, I'm going to receive all my questions from Mark or whether we're going to change up the uh, order of questions that were asked first. In. You, you don't like Mark's questions, huh? Well, I, <laughs> I mean, I just, I, to, to be totally. There's three of you and three of them. Yeah, but to be, just... I mean, to be totally honest, I just don't really like, you know, Mark. As a as a writer, that much. I mean. <laughs> All right, please, please keep it down. Um, we're just going to keep moving on. I mean, Representative France, would you like to answer that question? Thank you. On this issue, the stark difference between the extreme position of my opponent Joe Courtney and myself. Joe recently voted for a bill that would mandate across this country elective abortion all the way up to birth. And for those of you that are parents, you know that's depraved. It does not serve women, public health, or the unborn for that matter, to gaslight or posture on this issue, but that's exactly what Joe Courtney's done during this campaign. On average, once or twice a week, he sends out a fundraising email lying about my position, claiming that I support a total ban on abortion. Nothing could be farther from the truth. And he had to do that by cutting over 90 seconds out of a video to embed that in that email. When I submitted my questionnaires to pro-life groups to be supported, I made it very clear that whatever limits are put on by the states, I would support exceptions for the life of the mother, rape, and incest. Why did Joe Courtney do that? Because if he said his Republican opponent had a moderate position that was supported by over 70% of the residents of this country, he wouldn't get any fundraising money and he wouldn't be able to fearmonger and get you to vote for him on this issue. When you look at Europe, the norm is 12 weeks. The extreme is 15 weeks. What Joe Courtney voted for, that puts us on par if passed with China and North Korea. I don't think that's who we are. That's not who we are as Americans, as citizens, as people. Thank you. Yeah, that Mike's answer was... <laughs> Okay, okay. We're losing time here. Yeah, Mike's answer was total nonsense. Here's, here's the facts, okay? When Roe, v. Wade, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, Mike was out in front of the Capitol calling it a great day. I think it was a dark day because I think Roe, excuse me, Mr. Yeah, please let him answer the question. Because Roe got it right which said that th this decision should be made by the, by the patient and by her medical doctor or staff, qualified staff. In 1990, the state of Connecticut codified that very decision. I was there, I voted for it. 
and it was a massive majority, 136 to 12, 31 to 3. What we did in the House, which Mike totally misrepresented, is, is identical to what Connecticut did. If you put the two bills together side by side, you will see that the standard that was in, in, uh, included in that bill is the same one that is here in Connecticut. The question Mike was asked uh, on TV was whether or not he would vote for Lindsey Graham's bill, which would put a 15-week limit in terms of uh, abortion choice. I would call that a ban after 15 weeks. Most people do. And he answered yes. That would overturn Connecticut's law. So spare me your, your crocodile tears for states' rights. What you, the position that you have taken will capsize Connecticut's law. And that's not, in my opinion, and, and I've been around a few times in, in this part of Connecticut, that's not what people are looking for. The center of gravity in 1990 is the same today. They want a Roe v. Wade standard. Mr. Blacker, would you like to use your 30 seconds on, on a different issue? Yeah, if you want to let me talk. Yeah, sure, definitely. I'll talk about State Pier. I'll talk about State Pier at any chance I'm given. Uh, two ongoing FBI investigation, attorney general investigation, contracting standards board, uh, you know, stated that the deal was illegal. Uh, it, it, it is massively over budget. It, it is the poster child of uh, everything that is wrong with uh, Go government in Connecticut. Thank you. We'll switch up the order of questions. <laughs> Mark, why don't you go again, and we'll, we'll, we'll go this way. And uh, Representative France is going first. I will note that they all answered the same question. <laughs> but in any event. Uh, Certainly. Um, a little bit different. Um, there are reports that Ukraine has actually been following the American midterm elections with an eye towards what will be the continued support uh, for Ukraine in their war against Russia. So uh, the House voted, uh, I guess, in May uh, for a $40 billion aid package. So my question, gentlemen, is, what is the United States strategic interest that justifies a $40 billion investment and potentially more money in the future? I think we have a responsibility to support free democracies across the world. I would not have offered cash to Ukraine. I would have offered them the material that they needed, whatever they needed to be able to for them to defend their country. I think we've seen over $100 billion total that's gone to Ukraine and we really have no oversight of that money once it leaves. And we've seen that in history where we've given cash to other countries and we lose sight of where that money goes. If we give them the tools that they need in order to defend their country, that's what we should be doing. And I think that's the thing we should be doing to support democracies across the world. But it does not mean that we need to get involved in the battle itself. This is an invasion of a free country. It is an invasion by a dictator in Putin. And we need to support that democracy so that we have a future there and that we support that uh, ally that, uh, in Ukraine and make sure that they remain free. Thank you. So I think uh, for Ukrainians following this election, that answer actually would be pretty discomforting because in fact, if you look at the $40 billion package, it wasn't just all cash, but there was humanitarian relief there was money to, to bolster their financial system so that they would not totally collapse in a national emergency of just, you know, untold imagination. And, and, and there was military assistance. Uh, and just uh, this morning, they announced that they are going to be sending over more anti-aircraft, uh, uh, sorry, uh, missile defense systems, NASMs, to, to help protect them from the vicious types of indiscriminate bombings of civilians that just took place a couple days ago by Vladimir Putin. Um, yes, th th it is a democracy. It is an ally. Uh, we have, we're not, they're not a NATO ally, but w we have uh, treaty relationships with them. We have a lot of Ukrainian Americans who live in eastern Connecticut who uh, our office has been working with in terms of trying to provide a uh, safe harbor for people who are trying to emigrate away from the violence. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the Ukrainian American population is watching uh, the, the events here and in Washington very closely. That last vote 
that you talked about in May, there were 57 House Republicans that voted no. Again, that was a much bigger number than prior votes that took place. Um, you know, we listened to Marjorie Taylor Greene on the floor talking about NATO Nazis. That's what she was calling the Ukrainian military who are fighting heroically to save their democracy and their sovereignty. Um, they should be concerned because that is very much on the ballot in terms of whether or not we're going to stand by a great ally. Thank you. Mr. Blacker. So, so I, again, would say, what is the truth? What, what is happening in Ukraine? Not, not what are we reading or hearing you know, from mainstream media, not, not what the, the base level information that an average citizen has access to, but what is the, is the truth? And I, I couldn't answer whether we should be spending $40 billion without knowing what the full truth is of, of, of what is going on uh, there, what, what our true motivation, not, not, not the stated motivation, but what the true motivation for being there is. What was, what was the true motivation for being in Iraq or Afghanistan? I don't know. I'm not privy to that information, but I would believe that, uh, you know, as a congressman, you're going to have access to, or woman, you're going to have access to a whole lot more, uh, you know, information and, uh, you know, approach the problem to find the, find the truth. But, um, you know, I think that helping people is good. Uh, it can also be extremely, extremely, uh, you know, costly um, and, so that's all I have to say. Okay, Representative France, would you? And thank you. I agree, Joe, that there is both equipment and there's money in there. And I think that the money is the issue. And you can say that it's, it's propping up their economy, their banking system. The problem is you don't have any control of that money once it leaves, and it's tens of billions of dollars. We should have limited the support to the equipment that is needed and make sure that the people of Ukraine have all the support they need in order to defend their country, and they're doing a heroic job in order to do that and maintain their freedom against an invader that shouldn't be there. Thank you. Uh, Susan, let's, let's go to you next, and uh, Representative Courtney will answer first. Thank you. I wanted to ask you uh, your positions on further gun legislation. Uh, for the first time in 30 years, Congress got together and passed uh, legislation. Some feel it didn't go far enough. Some may feel the other way. And after Sandy Hook, Connecticut passed uh, some of the toughest gun laws in the country. Uh, and I add that it was uh, bipartisan for the most part. Uh, but yet we're seeing um, uh, record numbers of mass shootings. Uh, some are concerned about ghost guns. Should Connecticut and would you support more legislation how do you think uh, that we can address uh, this problem? And do you feel that the assault weapons ban should be back in place after being sunsetted? And do you feel that teachers should be armed in schools? Okay, so first of all, the, the gun safety bill, which was a great accomplishment uh, in terms of finally breaking through the NRA's stranglehold of Washington and getting people from both sides of the aisle to work together to get a very, I think, balanced, moderate, uh, package. Um, you know, one provision uh, in terms of cracking down on gun trafficking just uh, resulted in the first indictment uh, a, a couple days ago of a, a, a guy who was, again, taking guns uh, out of Mexico, into the, yeah, out of Mexico into the U.S., uh, obviously, um, you know, selling them illegally, and that is a, a, addressed in this bill, along with uh, a red flag incentive for states to adopt what Connecticut did many years ago to give families and, and police departments the, op uh, the opportunity for people who are severely mentally ill um, to, to have the, their firearms temporarily taken away from them, uh, and, and stronger background checks for individuals uh, under the age of, of 21. Um, th this, again, is uh, an issue which I don't think is, is over and settled, and I do think that um, in the wake of Sandy Hook, we need to do more at the national level. Thank you. Mr. Blacker. So in, would I support more legislation on guns? Not until uh, we determine what the underlying cause of the, and, and, and quickly, what the underlying cause of, of these mass shootings, of the increase of, uh, you, you know, uh, basically an increase in the use of uh, mass 
shooting. So whether it's something in the air, something in the water, whether it's that, that people are put under too much pressure from social media or from, from just massive amounts of, of negativity, um, what is causing the, the problem? I would say in, enforce the existing laws. Uh, and um, so that, that's how I'd answer that first question. The second question that you asked as to assault weapons ban, would I, would I support that when it sunsets? And the answer to that would be, an, uh, you know, if it's an outright ban on assault weapons, no, I would not support that. And would I support arming t teachers uh, in schools? Absolutely not. Thank you. Representative France. Thank you for the question. And the premise of it is, does government law banning a particular weapon work to prevent crime? The reality is no. All that the people that follow those laws are law-abiding gun owners. Does not prevent criminals from getting guns. And we see evidence of that. There is no evidence of a decrease in crime in our cities across this country when we ban a certain weapon. It is not an effective tool. We saw it in Connecticut after Sandy Hook. It was a three-legged stool. It was gun control, it was mental health, and it was hardening of our schools. Only one of those things got done. Now here we are, years later, we finally have gotten our schools hardened in Connecticut. But we've never, never done anything about mental health, and that has been a long-standing problem. And that is the root cause, and that is the problem that really is at the heart of many of these mass shootings. If we deal with that issue, we deal with taking care of the people that need help, that are dealing with mental issues, that would help solve a lot of these mass shootings and the problems we're seeing. Taking away the tool never solves the problem. We see evidence across the world of places where guns are banned. They bring a knife in. And so the reality is we need to look at the root cause of the problem on most of these mass shootings. It is something related to mental health. And that is the evidence that we saw at Sandy Hook, and it is true across this country. And we need to deal with that issue if we want to deal with limiting the outcome of these mass shootings. So I've got good news for Mike. Actually, the bill did include a um, really solid, very strong investment in mental health. That was actually one of the negotiating points that a, a good compromise um, included. Um, of course, there, there is um, some government benefit in terms of regulating uh, arms uh, purchases and possession. Uh, you can't go out and buy a, um, you know, a stinger or uh, a javelin or a fully automatic machine gun. Those are prohibited. And I can't imagine, Mike, you're actually saying that that's um, not worth it or ineffective. Of course it is. And the question is really finding that right balance. I would support reinstating the assault weapon ban. Thank you. All right, Stan, you get the, uh, you get the next question. And you're going to start with Mr. Blacker. Great. That wasn't a joke. Um, two, two 21st century presidents have risen to the office without winning the popular vote. Do you think it's time to get rid of the Electoral College in favor of a popular vote and direct democracy? No, no, I like, I like the system that we have. It may be imperfect, but I like, I like it the way that it is. Um, so do, do you want me to try and expand on that, on that answer? Why do you say that? I mean, are you okay with people losing the popular vote but still becoming president? Yeah, I mean, I'm okay. Uh, as I understand it, uh, you know, it, it served us, you know, for, for, for a long time, and I'm, I'm okay with it the way that it is. I think that if you look at, uh, and I'd have to, you know, look visually at what you're describing, but if you take a, certain states have a massive population, uh, you know, and, and then so I could see how a person could win the popular vote, but, uh, you know, lose the electoral, but no, I, I like it the way it is. Representative France. First deal with the first thing, Joe, you should know, a typical politician, you throw an absurd example of a stinger missile. Are you kidding me? What we're talking about is semi-automatic weapons that are in regular use. That's what you're talking about, banning is a semi-automatic weapon. The assault weapon is a, is a made-up term, made up by the government. We get back to the Electoral College. We are not. Okay. 
we are not a we are not a democracy. If we go to popular vote, that's when we become a pure democracy. We look in history; democracies fail. We are a representative republic, guarded by guarded by our constitution, and our constitution has this process of the electoral college to ensure it is not the equivalent of mob rule. That one dominant state or one dominant city, and if you look at the last election. The city of Los Angeles was the margin in the 2016 election, essentially. That is the danger of walking away from the Electoral College. The states get to decide on how the electors are from. Most states choose to use the, whatever the winner of the popular vote in that state. All the electors go that way, but that's not true in every state. But that's the beauty of our constitutional republic. The states get to decide how the electors, how they want to be represented, and how they will elect the president of the United States by using the electors in the constitutional process. That ensures that we don't have you know, a close-knit or a large population in this, in this country dominating the effort to elect our president. And we are truly represented across all 50 states. Thank you. So, <laughs> Representative Carton. So the question obviously um, was posed correctly that um, we have had now two elections where someone has been uh, inaugurated who did not win the popular vote. There is not a single other elective office that I can think of from a school board all the way up to the United States Senate or any governor that um, has any sort of um, screen or interference with the, with the, the suffrage, with the popular vote. Uh, I would support um, eliminating the Electoral College, but I'm not gonna waste a lot of energy on it because a constitutional amendment like that is probably almost uh, an impossible prospect. However, what we ought to do is pass the Electoral Count Certification Act, which we just passed in the House and the Senate is considering, so that we do not repeat the just outrageous events of January 6th where members of Congress said... Let him answer the question, please. Where members of Congress thought that they could substitute their power for that of courts that certified the election results from all 50 states, uh, which, again, would have been a... a Every single one of those states had had their uh, elections certified by their election officers. There had been lawsuits, over 60 of them. None of them prevailed. And yet we still, even after the insurrection, at 1 o'clock in the morning when we marched in there with broken glass and just stunned and overwhelmed Capitol Police officers and staff, people still voted not to certify the election. We, the election certification law will prevent that, and it's time for the Senate to take it up and pass it. Thank you. Mr. Blacker, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, so, I'll, um, I mean, I, I said what I had to say, and uh, I'll just add that I'm uh, feeling a little bit left out over here, a little uh, in the cold as these guys argue like a old uh, married couple with their, <laughs> you know, I mean, with their, their, you know, I mean, stereotypical party views, and uh, they're, they're just ignoring me going back and forth at each other, which is just a, a, a politician's move. So that's all I have to say. Okay, well, that, that ends the uh, question and answer part of the, the night. We're moving along quickly here, trying to keep it to an hour. So now you each have two minutes for a closing statement, starting with Representative France. Once again, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to watch this debate. You heard contrast between my opponent, the 16-year incumbent, Joe Courtney, and myself on many issues. But I'll ask you this. If Joe Courtney had told you two years ago that he would sit idly by while President Biden issued almost 50 executive orders in the first two weeks in office that led to loss of energy independence, increasing gas prices long before Putin invaded Ukraine. Would you have voted for him? Probably not. If he had told you two years ago that he would vote for trillions of dollars of spending over the last two years that led to inflation, ultimately to a recession, the worst recession since the Great Depression, forcing you to take challenges of how you feed your family, how you're going to heat your homes this winter, would you have voted for him? Probably not. If you had known two years ago that he would sit idly by while President Biden claimed a political victory to retreat from Afghanistan by the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and do nothing that caused the sacrifice 
of 13 brave servicemen and women to lose their lives. And oh, by the way, th they were never supposed to be there. They were sent there because of the lack of planning and lack of oversight of Congress and Joe Courtney in that process. They were never supposed to be there. We also left hundreds of U.S. citizens and, Af and thousands of Afghan allies behind. We do not leave people behind. Would you have voted for them? Probably not. Now is your chance. When we look at where we are headed and what we are doing, you can find out more about my campaign at votemikefrance.com. And I'm asking for your vote on November 8th so that you can have a Eastern Connecticut deserves a leader who will serve them, not somebody who puts party politics ahead of the people. Thank you. Representative Courtney, closing statement. Great. Thank you um, to the New London Day, uh, the panel, um, and all of the other sponsors, and to my two colleagues who are up here on the floor uh, for, again, a, a vigorous civil debate uh, this evening. Um, there is a real choice that's before us today. Uh, Mike, a couple days ago, uh, joined the other Republican candidates in New Britain, pledging his loyalty to Kevin McCarthy's commitment to America. I would call it the involuntary commitment of America, if, God forbid, it ever passed. He would rescind uh, the, the uh, green energy provisions, which we've discussed here tonight, which is not just good for the planet and for our country, but also good for this region. It would rescind the prescription drug uh, medication, uh, portion of the bill, which finally allows the government to negotiate lower prices for seniors. Uh, that is going to kick in in January with a $35 a month cap on insulin and an overall cap of $2,000. As long as I've been in office, seniors have been groaning under the weight of prescription drugs, and it has been special interest lobbyists that have blocked consideration and passage of that bill, and we finally did it. We, we finally started to write the tax imbalance of corporations that were paying nothing to, to the uh, U.S. Treasury, even though they were benefiting from, again, a, a country which has given them so much in terms of legal stability, a trained workforce, and, and a free market for them to succeed. So there actually has been, I think, a lot of progress over the last two years. I didn't even bring up the infrastructure bill, which we can see unfolding right out this door with the, with the repairs of the Gold Street Gold Star Bridge. I have, as I started out this evening, my North Star has been focused on making this part of Connecticut grow. I love Eastern Connecticut over 16 years, and I am ready to take on the job again to make sure that all that job opportunities that we talked about are going to be connected to the good people of this region and that we are going to continue to go to a successful higher place. Thank you for your consideration. I ask for your vote. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Blacker. So, uh, you, you, you've heard from me, you've heard about me, now I want to talk about the Green Party. I'm going to read their ten key values. Uh, grassroots democracy, social justice, ecological wisdom, nonviolence, decentralization, community-based economics, gender equality and cooperation, diversity, responsibility, and future focus. So, if, if those things are of any interest, uh, you, you know, to people in this crowd, or if you, you know, you feel that you, you share those values. I hope that you stop at the table just outside the door and, and hear about the long list of other, part, you know, other candidates that the Green Party is, is, is running. And uh, you know, I hope that people vote their conscience, uh, you, you know, not the lesser of uh, you, you know, two, two candidates. I think a lot of people are gonna vote, uh, you know, for, for Joe Courtney because he's the good old uh, golden retriever and he, uh, you know, go, 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 go get me a sub, Joe, and oh, you brought back two, and I, 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 I think that, uh, so, I, but, but the, the thing is, is that Joe's, Joe's not going to be able to do this job for, forever, and, and what I have on both of these guys is my youth and the, the aggression and the confidence that comes with that. And, and, I'm, and you can laugh, but I'm, I'm not joking that youth 
People with youth approach problems differently, and there needs to be a transfer of the knowledge that both of these people have to the younger generation. Uh, and the Titanic was never gonna sink, Rudy was never gonna make it onto the field, and I'm never gonna win this election. So if you don't believe in, if, if, if you don't believe that it's possible that, that I win this election, you don't believe in America. Thank you. I'd like to thank our, our panelists for the excellent questions and to the three candidates. Uh, thank you for coming and good luck in campaigning. Now you can applaud all you'd like. Yeah.